Hello everybody, uh, we're in Ed's Lounge, famous for playing with Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac and um, I'm going to do an interview with him. First thing I'd like to know is, uh, where do you, how did you get started in guitar playing? I got started in a, in a school band, we, uh, that's us uh -huh. playing in the hospital where I met my wife. Right, okay. And that's more or less morphed into the Shanes. Yeah. And one day our manager <coughs> introduced us to somebody called Mike Fleetwood. Right. And not he, Mick Fleetwood then. Didn't no, like to be called Mick. No. He changed it when he joined John Mayall. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, he was the best drummer we'd had. Mm -hmm. And we our manager got us a residency for which we were just too unprepared. We didn't have enough material, we had to play four hours a night. So the manager was a guy called Peter Bardens, who was a very good piano player, and he joined us on piano. And then we decided to change our name to the Shanes, mm -hmm. uh, all with Mick Fleetwood on board. and. Uh, we had a very charismatic manager who built us in the cavern in 1963 as London's answer to the Beatles. Ah. And we, um, we managed to have an accident in the first song which set the whole place laughing. <coughs> and then we recovered on the second song and <coughs> recovered sufficiently that we inherited one of the many Beatles fan clubs. Yeah, because the Beatles had sold out and become famous, mm. and they were already mum's and dad's material. So is this and this about a year after the Beatles, was it, that were playing in the Cavern Club? Or? Yes, it was when they were having hits like She Loves You over here, yeah. before they had a hit with it in the States. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, so uh, our manager was so charismatic that although we'd, we'd lost all credibility mm -hmm. in, in the cavern, mm -hmm. he got us, he had the manager of the Blue Angel grovelling in gratitude at, at letting us play there the following week. Where's the, where was the Blue Angel? The Blue Angel was the other venue in, in Liverpool. In Liverpool, yeah. All right. And they were friendly <coughs> rivals. Um, and that charismatic manager um, ripped us off and people came to our rescue and got us on the Ronettes tour. All right, yeah. I'd have to say the manager ripped you off. I mean, I, we all know that that was a very common thing in those days. Yep. But you presu presumably weren't expecting that at the time. No. But again, we didn't really suffer. He, he was very clever and subtle about it. Mm. Um, much later on he got a taxi from Liverpool to the Dorchester mm -hmm. and in the taxi with him were Billy J. Kramer, Cilla Black, the, the bloke who eventually became Cilla Black's husband and uh, Billy, J., Billy J. Kramer Cilla Black, and Brian Epstein. Right. They were all in that cab and when they got to the Dorchester our ex-manager said to the doorman, oh sort the cab out will you and put it on the bill. <laughs> and that amount of money for the cab was deducted from the doorman's wages. Oh. So he paid for a, a private detective at his own expense and knowing that he wouldn't get all his money back, but yeah. he did it anyway to get revenge and that was the first time that, that our manager went to prison in this country. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, He'd been in prison in Spain yeah. and uh, France I believe. Uh -huh. Okay, getting back to, um, yes. so what was your first guitar and what made you pick up the guitar? It was something called a New England guitar <coughs> and I've been looking for a picture of Cliff Richard because he had one. But did you actually buy it yourself or did your parents buy you one for your birthday or, uh, or what? It was the first guitar I bought for myself. Mm. Uh, up until then I'd been borrowing the guitars. But I mean what made you think I want to play guitar, not the, I don't know, double bass or something else. You know. um, I was potty about somebody called Jack Scott, mm -hmm. not the weatherman, 
Mm -hmm. He was a Canadian rock and roller. Yeah. And he played guitar. Yeah. So I wanted to play his songs. And uh, I, I also wanted to compose songs like him. Yeah. Um, so it seemed logical to get a guitar. And actually, this, this might even be it. Good grief, this is it. So that's the first guitar that you had? Yeah. Right, we're going to probably get a close-up of that somehow or other uh, at yep. some point. So were you actually self-taught then? Did you just teach yourself or did you have a, a, a guitar teacher? I uh, started with um, Playing a Day by Burt Whedon. Oh yes, yes. And the, the, yeah. I think the reason that so many people credit um, the book is that is that it seems that we all pick up different pages mm -hmm. and that gets us started. Yeah, yeah. And he teaches you to play Over the Sea to Sky very badly mm -hmm. in one day. Mm, yeah. And most of us sort of, oh, I've tough, tough, tough. I, I really want to play Chuck Berry or whatever it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And you you learn it off record. Right, right, I we'll see. And so, it, yeah, oh, sorry, carry on. In yeah. those days, if you wanted to hear rock and roll, you had to, I had to listen to Radio Luxembourg. Yes. So all rock and roll was concentrated on Radio Luxembourg. Yeah. So you, you didn't have to listen to the BBC and plough through 99% rubbish to get to the 1% good stuff. You could hear <coughs> all on Radio Luxembourg. Yeah, it's still the same today, I think, really. Yeah. But uh, I listened to Caroline, I don't know, Radio Caroline's still going. And, um, in, a, in a form, get, yes. Well, yeah, you can get it on the internet. That. And it's legal yeah, now. That's right. But yeah. um, so, so you, you you learned to play guitar. But so that that was the first band that you were in. What what were they called again? The Cascades. Didn't that you was say? Eddie and the Cascades. Right. Okay. Eddie and get the Cascades. It, get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, and and so get, getting back to how how did you actually meet Mick Fleetwood again? You said he just moved up to London. And it was at Notting Hill Gate, wasn't it? Was that right? This guy playing the piano yeah. is Peter Bardens. Right. And he got a, an immaculate brown suit for his birthday. Yeah. And it made him want to be Brian Epstein. Right. And I, he had to know me, so he yeah. said, I'll, I'll manage your band. Yeah. Yeah. And then a few weeks later, Mike Fleetwood yes. moved okay. in a couple of doors away from him. Right. And Pete yeah. heard him practicing in the garage. Yeah. And I, I think. It, was it right that that Mike Fleetwood had his sister was was living yeah. in the area or something? He lived, stayed with her. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was her house. Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah, and so um, so the chains was up up and running, and then from from uh, from from Liverpool, what, what was your next? Where where did you play next from the Cavern Club? Then we did the Ronettes tour. Yeah. And then we were offered the Crystals tour, but the Pete had become the leader of the band by then. Yeah. Um, and he said, no, um, I want us to be a blues band and play in the marquee. Mm -hmm. And I said, if we don't do the Crystals tour, I'm going to leave the band. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, Ed, I've uh, been wondering how to tell you this, but uh, so mm -hmm. um, that's the, that was the last gig I did with the Shanes. Yeah. Um, six, six weeks. In the um, in in the marquee, right. while they were looking for somebody else. Yeah. So you play in the marquee. Yeah. Then? Yeah. Six times. Yeah. Yeah. And um, several times with the Ingos, which was the next band. Right. I remember you telling me <coughs> in previous conversations that you you'd sort of met the Stones and you you supported them, were you, or something? Yeah, they were on the Ronettes tour. On the Ronettes tour. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit a bit about that? Some little details. Uh, one day on, on that tour um, Mick Jagger called me into the, into his dressing room Yeah. and said Keith show him how to play fortune teller <laughs> and um, and Keith Richards said well you know you play it all wrong don't you and I said yes we know we play it all wrong but but we've decided that what we play is our version so right. not really yeah. interested in changing it and, and uh, Keith Richards turned away and Mick Jagger says, no, go on Keith, try. So Keith Richards 
reluctantly showed me the chords, knowing yeah. that it was, it was going to make no difference. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Um, a few months later, when I was in the Ingos, mm -hmm. I was walking down um, Old Compton Street. Yeah. We'd just come out of the Two Eyes. Yeah. And um, this was long after the Two Eyes was cool. And oh, wait a minute, what's the Two Eyes? It was it was cool when people what? like uh, Cliff Richards and Tommy Steele. Well, it's a club. It's a pub. Do you mean? What? It's a it was a cafe. A cafe, right? It yeah. Was a, and that was around Old Compton Street area, was it? Yeah, yeah. In, in Old Compton Street. Yeah. yeah. And it was it was so cool at, at one time that people like Tommy Steele and Cliff Richards yeah. used to pretend that they played there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it did help their careers. <coughs> yeah. So anyway, we were walking down Old Compton Street and uh, I heard a voice, Oi, you! Oi, come here! And look round and there was yeah. some guy at the other end of the street waving at us. Yeah. And I said, hang on guys, I think somebody went, uh, Ed, we're, we're not going to wait for you and we're not going to come back for you, keep up. Yeah. And I said, oh no, I think it's, it's, and then the, the, the guy came a bit closer. Oi, you, singer! I can't remember your name. And I realised it was Mick Jagger. Yeah. <laughs> and he remembered me from the tour, which surprised me. And he had Keith Richards with him. And yeah. Keith Richards is saying, come on, we, we're going to be late. And um, Mick Jagger ins insisted on taking me round to a place called the Roundhouse mm -hmm. in Wardour Street, yeah. which is not there anymore. Yeah. And so they insisted on buying me a couple of drinks. <laughs> um, that's it. That's oh, our story. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I remember you, you, again in a previous conversation, you said something about when the, in, on the Ronettes tour, yeah. um, that, that um, when, when the other musicians were playing, I think you mentioned the Pirates. Yes. Playing, um, they were on two of the dates. Yeah. And on both dates, when the Pirates were playing, all the lead guitarists in all the other bands yeah. on the tour were standing in the wings watching Mick, fingers, Mick Green's Mick, fingers. Yeah, that's amazing because he, yeah. he really is one of my favourites, Mick Green is. And it was really frustrating because we, we all wanted to learn what his secret was. Yeah. And we watched his hands and they were doing virtually nothing. <laughs> yeah. And there was all this amazing music coming out. Yeah. And for the people perhaps that haven't really heard of Mick Green, he was um, he more or less taught um, Wilco Johnson how to play, and Dr. Feelgood. Yeah. And um, and uh, he used to live locally in, in Ilford, I believe. As well. Gants Hill, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. He, invite, he was a very, a very helpful guy. He invited me round his place to help him write some songs. For yeah. Engelbert Humperdinck, because he was working for Humperdinck at the time. All oh, right. Yeah. Nothing happened. But yeah. And uh, and when I was working at Holiday Music in Leytonstone, yeah, he wanted to reform the Pirates, and he wanted me to to pretend to be Johnny Kidd. Yeah. Because he thought I had a similar voice. Yeah. Um, but I never got round to it. Mm. So. Yeah. Yes, um, you had a little anecdote about Peter Green, I seem to remember. Yeah, they yeah. Um, they tried him out for to, as a replacement for me, but then he got something else. Mm -hmm. And then he formed a band of his own called Peter Green and something or other. And um, M Mike Fleetwood sat in with him mm -hmm. and um, Peter Green tried to row... Mike Fleetwood into, oh you succeeded in rowing Mike Fleetwood into uh, the John Mayall band which was a very cool band to be in at the time mm. and in that band he decided to change it to Mick Fleetwood mm. yeah. and uh, I met um, Peter Green a couple of times when I was uh, following the uh, development of the Shanes, which became the Steam Packet. I can't remember. Oh, Peter B's Luna, so they were called. Mm. With um, Peter Green on, on lead guitar. And he was good then. Yeah. But he really raised his game when he worked with John Mayall. Right. And then even more when he formed a band with uh, John Mayall's bass player, mm -hmm. John McPhee, mm -hmm. and John Mayall's drummer, 
Mick Fleetwood. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is relevant, but I, I, yeah. I came home from work one day and my kids said, Oh, um, we've just been watching um, watching TV and uh, you know the Fleetwoods, don't you? And I said, Oh yes, they were a, they were a trio. They were a boy and two girls and they sang a record called Come Softly To Me. I looked at each other. <laughs> no, 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 nothing to do with that. Dad, I thought you knew him, and I, I said, "Well, no, I didn't. Didn't know them. They were an American band." I said, "Oh, you know, Rumours." And I said, "Oh, you mean Fleetwood Mac?" Yes, Dad. Uh, <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know them, but I, I do know Mike. Mm -hmm. Mike, Mike Fleetwood. No, Dad, it's Mick." <laughs> And, oh, uh, okay. And, okay, how old is he? And I said, well, when I was 20, he was 16, and now I'm 47, so now he must be 43. No, Dad, he's 48. <laughs> I said, well, he did seem a bit tall for 16. Yeah, Dad, whatever. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, oh, what about the Jose, uh, Jose Feliciano story? Well, that's it. Oh, it's Jose Feliciano's roadie yeah. for, for one gig at yeah. the London Palladium. Right. And I'd, I had previously, I was working in a guitar shop at the time and I'd yeah. sold him a guitar which we thought we would never get rid of because it had all sorts of whistles and bells all over it. Mm -hmm. But it suited him because he was blind. Yeah. And so therefore if he, if he wanted tremolo or... or reverb or something, he'd know exactly where to put his hand. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to prove that he could play rock and roll lead guitar if he really wanted to. Yeah. So he he um, wanted someone to, someone he could trust to put the foot pedals exactly where he was expecting to find them. Right, that makes sense, yeah. So that was my job. Wow. <laughs> so I did that for one performance at the uh, London Palladium. Mm. And then afterwards, he, he played a piece where he, he'd said, I'm this is about the Battle of Bilbao, and at one point you'll hear, you'll hear cannons booming, and horses screaming, <laughs> and the audience burst out laughing. And then when you got to that point in the in the in the piece, it was an yeah. instrumental piece. Yeah, you could tell where the cannons were booming and the horses were screaming. <laughs> and I, wow. I said, I was watching the fingers while that. I, I couldn't figure how you would the sound. And he says, Ah, oh, Ed, that I was using open C tuning. And I said, mm. What's that? Mm. And he, he told me it goes C, G, C, G, C, E. Yeah. And um, he didn't need to do that. And then I, I really respect him for that because he was getting so much hype mm. and he was being sold as a serious and a classical mm. and none, <laughs> none of this rock and roll rubbish and, all, and everything. And it didn't go to his head. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's like Ray Kuda. Yeah. Didn't go to his head. And a bit like Marty Wilde, mm -hmm. who was also on the Ronettes tour. Yeah. Do you have a link to say anything about him? Um, well, I couldn't oh. think of anything positive. And I yeah. think that's why I changed this. I composed a song about him, which was very negative. Mm. And I realised, well, no, hang on. He was, I did like him when he got started. Yeah. And it's all the nasty stuff happened when I was working with him, but I still liked him then. Yeah, yeah. So I, one, during lockdown, I finished off a song called "My Hero," which is very loosely about him. Mm -hmm. And I, I, all the stories that I tell about Marty Wilde are a bit, bit negative. So therefore, I don't want, want to tell them anymore. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks very much for that, Ed. It's um, thank you. I, I feel very privileged because uh, it's uh, correct. Some. <laughs> Something I wanted to do myself, be a full-on yeah. musician and have that sort of CV and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you Chris.